evening. Welcome to part 15 of the teachings of the Ashtabhakra Gita. Not teachings, contemplations on the teachings of the Ashtabhakra Gita. Um, so we're coming up towards the end of the, the, the teachings. Uh, we're on teaching number 18 tonight, which is a really long one actually. So um, I'm going to kind of talk less and obviously spend more time just reading the teaching. Hopefully do it justice for you. Um, it's been a, quite a few days since the last video. Um, just been really busy. You know, even though we're all locked away, it was tend to find that jobs crop up, things need to be done. Um, spending time, uh, Wendy and I, uh, in the great outdoors as well, you know, even though the encouragement is to stay at home. Um, personally, I find that to be extremely unhealthy and uh, as long as you're sensible being outdoors and not encountering anyone, um, I feel is better for the soul, better for the mental health, better for the physiology, better all round really. Um, so yeah, so we've been spending some time walking and uh, by the sea, getting some sea air, vitamin C, vitamin D, it's been beautiful sunshine as well. Vitamin D of course is amazing for your immune system. So yeah, um, I've always been a bit of a contrarian, never really kind of gone with the flow, gone, well not necessarily gone with the flow, gone with the, the status quo. Um, I like to listen to my own inner guidance rather than oftentimes the guidance of others without really stringent, stringent research. Um, and I guess uh, that kind of mirrors some of the teachings of, uh, of Don Miguel Ruiz, who, who talks about a great book, actually, um, the, the, the five, the five agreements, I think he calls it. Um, of which which one is to listen but to be skeptical <laughs> yeah so everything that you're listening to now in this little video is yeah great listen but be skeptical yeah don't trust trust everything you hear yeah trust in god only <laughs> whatever god is for you okay Trust in God, but lock up your camels. We live in a world right now which is in a state of chaos and a state of turmoil. Um, it's in a state of ending. Um, my my view, um, and I'm not asking you to share this view, as in share it and agree with it yourself. But my view is that we are we are in the final death throes of um, a Western civilization model which just doesn't work or never really has worked or has, or has never really been sustainable um, and hasn't provided the, um, the equanimity for everybody, for every human on this planet it's been based on false teachings. It's been based on um, external stimulus as a promotory tool for self-fulfillment and satisfaction. It has promoted egotistical and narcissistic tendencies and... Every single one of us, whether you want to hear this or not, has been duped by it. <laughs> We've all fallen for it, hook, line and sinker. And there's a karmic implication to that as well. There's a karmic implication to making choices which are service to self rather than service to the whole. Right? Not least, you know, the more we serve ourselves the more the whole actually suffers. So 
you know, we're 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 at a crossroads. I've already spoken about that in, in one of the previous videos. We're we're a, we're a, we're a bit of a Y junction, and I've never really been the sort of person who want who's wanted to go and look outside and fix the outside. Yeah, although at times I have tried, <laughs> it's generally never been very successful for me anyway. Um. Because I haven't actually, or I hadn't at that point in time, worked on the the inner portion of myself that my perception of the outside was, was merely reflecting. So I can't stress this enough that the inner work, the work on yourself, is the most important thing you can do in these types of situations in these times, because if you come out of, of a self-isolating quarantined slowdown like this, guns blazing, raring to go, raring to get back to normal, raring to get back to that pace of life, that pace of existence, that consumptive, um, almost insane derangement that a lot of people were living prior to this event, then I don't think you're going to last long. I, 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 or, or rather, I think if, if everyone goes back to that, we are not going to last very long. Yeah, we're not going to last very long as, as a humanity. It's, uh, it's going to unravel pretty quick. So we have to learn the inner teachings from this. We have to earn, learn the inner lessons from, from these challenges that unless you've taken time to actually truly contemplate and reflect upon your lives, when you've been given the opportunity to do so and take time to be with yourself, and understand that the change in pace is showing you an opportunity. You know, you may not want to be completely back to, or rather you may not want to continue this kind of pace of life going forward, but maybe finding some middle ground between this pace of life and the pace of life and the, the, the craziness of the past. Um, might be a really positive step in the right direction. Who am I to tell anyone how to live their lives? I'm certainly not trying to do that. All I'm trying to encourage, again, with these teachings and some of these little videos is to really go inward and use these challenges as opportunities for change. Yeah? Um, change which brings you and us as a collective back to a more balanced state of mind, yeah, heart and motor sexual energy, which is which is again the three once the three centers are in balance, life is in balance. Yeah. So and my kids are screaming upstairs, you can probably hear them. I make no apology. <laughs> they came back today and uh, peace reigned <laughs> until that point. And now chaos reigns. So funnily enough, the teaching tonight is all about peace. And as a slight digression, well, it's not really a digression, but I was thinking about how do we how do we feel peace inside you know why do we feel peace inside sometimes and not all the time and peace peace is a funny thing i mean to me peace um is related to an element of inner stillness yeah and no matter what's happening out there that inner center that inner stillness um if you can reside within that you're not going to be pulled or drawn into more chaotic, disharmonious states of being. And I kind of remembered, you know, having done a little bit of work with shamanism 
Um, some of the Mongolian uh, shamans talk about the goal, G-O-L, the goal is the centre of a spiral. Okay? And then I thought, oh, what, what, what else looks or, or can act like a spiral? And, and, and immediately my memory came back to the old playground the merry-go-rounds that, that we used to play on when we were kids. The proper ones. The ones that used to get really scuffed knees and, and broken arms on, yeah? <laughs> not not these safety ones now, you know? Proper merry-go-rounds where you had to push the bloody thing and then you kind of lent off it and your whole world just went into total freaking nonsense, didn't it? And then you all fell off and everything started spinning. But if you sat in the middle of that merry-go-round, right in the centre of it, no matter how fast it was going, you weren't feeling the same effects as the poor bastard clinging on for grim death on the outside of it. And then you go, wow, you know, so in the centre of a, a spinning force, there is peace, there is stillness, right? In the centre of a storm, there is an eye, yeah, an eye of a storm, which is just utter peace and stillness. If you look at the way galaxies form, they create spirals in the centre of these galaxies, I can only assume there is peace and stillness. Whereas the more you exit or, or distance yourself from that centre, the more the forces are entropic and chaotic. And as within, so without. So as, as beings, we have a centre. We have a centre. And the more we can reside within our centre no matter what's happening beyond that, the more we can feel peace and, and stillness. So you might ask, how do you develop your centre? Or how do you remember your centre? You know, it's not about developing your centre. Yeah, you've got one. Everyone's got one. It's about remembering you've got one. And it can really be as simple as, as doing what myself and Wendy did yesterday, you know, just having a walk down the beach and lying in the sun and breathing deep, long breaths where you're not really engaging in the mind. You're not really engaging in physical activity. You're not really even really emoting at all. You're just being, you're just being, okay? And that breath, long, deep breath just brings you back to that home, that centre, where stillness reigns, yeah? That's power. That stillness is power. That centre holds the galaxy together, stops it spinning off too quickly, yeah? That power is a draw. It's like a... It's, a, it's gravity. It's love, yeah? So it's very important, particularly in times like this, to remember that you are... Peace, you are stillness, you are no thing, you are um, the central point of your own universe, okay? And by all means, go play, yeah? Engage in the chaos, in the, in the movement, in the doing, in the, in the dancing, in all the, in all the stuff that, 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 that we do. But if you do that without remembering, then you're going to spin out quite far, okay? And coming back becomes more difficult. So it's about keeping one foot on the edge of the merry-go-round and one foot right in the center, okay? And, and creating that balance so that, you, so that you don't just spin out crazy. Don't go back to the outer edge of chaos and disharmony and stress and pace of life, which is killing you. Okay. Find some middle ground. Find some healthy middle ground. And that might mean giving up some stuff. Yeah, because if 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 the if the unhealthy spin out was to maintain stuff or the attachment to stuff, 
and things, then you might want to rethink that a little bit and try and find joy in some of the simpler um, activities in life, like just putting your feet in the sand and feeling the, the warmth of the sand on your feet and having a hot cup of coffee and just watching the world go by without any need to change anything. Yeah, there's joy, so much joy in, in, in doing that. And you can only find that joy when you still this, when this becomes still, when this becomes still, when that becomes when everything, when you draw back into the center of the spiral, then, then you'll feel contentment. So, teaching 18 is all about peace, okay, and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, wow, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven pages long, so I might not read it all in one go, I'm going to give it a go, okay, so here we go, and Ashtavakra said, praise that which is bliss itself, which is by nature stillness and light, and which by its knowing reveals the world as a dream. One may enjoy the abundant pleasures of the world, but will never be happy until giving them up. How can one whose innermost heart has been scorched by the sun of sorrow that comes from duty be happy until the sweet rain of torrential stillness? The universe is but a thought in consciousness. In reality, it is nothing. One who sees the true nature of existence and non-existence never ceases to exist. The self, which is absolute, effortless, timeless, immaculate, is without limits and at no distance from you. You are forever it. For those whose vision becomes unclouded, illusion evaporates and self becomes known. All sorrow is instantly dispelled. Seeing everything is imagination, knowing the self as timelessly free, the sage lives as a child. Knowing himself as absolute, knowing existence and non-existence to be imagination only, what is there for the desireless one to learn, say or do? Knowing for certain that all is self, the sage has no trace of thoughts such as I am this or I am not that. The yogi who finds stillness is neither distracted nor focused. He knows neither pleasure nor pain. Ignorance dispelled, he is free of knowing. Heaven or poverty, gain or loss, society or solitude. To the yogi, free of conditioning, there is no difference. Religious merit, sensory pleasure, worldly prosperity, discrimination between this and that, these have no significance to the yogi free of opposites, such as I do this and this I do not. The yogi who is liberated while living has no duties in this world, no attachments in his heart, his life proceeds without him. For the great soul who abides beyond desire, where is illusion? Where is the universe? Where is meditation on that? Where even is liberation from them? He who sees the world may not try to renounce it. But what can the desireless one do? He sees there is nothing to see. He who has seen the supreme Brahma thinks, I am Brahma. But he who has transcended all thought, what can he think? He knows no other than self. He achieves self-control who sees his own distraction. But the great soul is not distracted. He has nothing to achieve. He has nothing to do. 
the sage may live as an ordinary man, but he is not. He sees he is neither focused nor distracted and finds no fault with himself. He who is beyond existence and non-existence, who is wise, satisfied and free from desire, does nothing, though the world may see him in motion. The wise one is not troubled by action or inactivity. He lives happily doing whatever gets done. Like a leaf in the wind, the liberated one is untethered from life, desireless, independent and free. For one who has transcended the world, there is no joy or sorrow. Mind still, the body lives on without them. One who knows self, whose mind is serene and spotless, does not desire to give up anything, nor does he miss what is not there. His mind, being a natural state of emptiness, the wise one knows nothing of honour and dishonour. He does what comes to be done. One who acts seeing, this is done by the body, not by the self, indeed does nothing, no matter how much acting takes place. The liberated one acts without claiming to be acting, but he is no fool. He is blessed and happy, even though in the world. Having had enough of the endless workings of the mind, the wise one comes to rest. He neither thinks nor knows nor hears nor sees. Beyond stillness, beyond distraction, the great soul thinks nothing of liberation or bondage. Having seen the universe's void, even though it seems to exist, he is God. He who believes he is a person is constantly acting, even when the body is at rest. The sage knows he is not a person and therefore does nothing, even when the body is in motion. The mind of the liberated one is neither troubled nor pleased. It is actionless, motionless, desireless and free of doubt. The liberated one does not exert effort to meditate or act. Action and meditation just happen. Hearing ultimate truth, the dull-witted man is bewildered. The wise man, hearing truth, retreats within and appears dull-witted. The ignorant practice meditation and no thought. The wise, like men in deep sleep, do nothing. The ignorant man finds no peace, either by effort or non-effort. The wise man, by truth alone, is stilled. Though they are by nature self alone, pure intelligence, love and perfection, though they transcend the universe and are clearness itself, men of the world will not see this through meditation and practices. The ignorant man will never be liberated by his repetitious practices. Blessed is he who, by simple understanding, enters timeless freedom. Because he desires to know God, the ignorant man can never become that. The wise man is God, because he is free of desire and knows nothing. Unable to stand steady and eager for salvation, the ignorant perpetuate the illusion of the world, seeing the world as the source of all misery, the wise cut it off at the root. The fool thinks peace comes by taming the mind. He will never attain it. The wise one abides in no mind and is stillness itself. For he who thinks knowledge is things and ideas, how can there be self-knowledge? The wise do not see separate things, only the timeless self. The fool tries to control the mind with the mind. What a folly. The wise one delights in self alone. There is no mind to master. Some believe in existence. Others believe nothing exists. Rare is the one who believes nothing and is never confused. Men of proud intellect may say they believe the self is one without other, but being mired in illusion, they do not actually know self. Their lives unfold in misery. 
The mind of one desiring liberation depends on things for perception. The mind of the liberated one perceives no thing and is free of desire. Timid men fear sensory experience. Much as they do tigers, they seek refuge in caves and try to unthink the world. Sensory experiences are like elephants, who, upon encountering a desireless man, see him as a lion. They immediately turn on their heels, or, if unable to escape, stay on to flatter and serve him. A man with no doubts, who knows self, has no need of practice of liberation. Seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, eating, he lives happily as he is. One whose mind is emptied and unconflicted by the presence of truth sees nothing to do, nothing to avoid, nothing to warrant his indifference. The sage does whatever appears to be done without thinking of good or bad. His actions are those of a child. Depending on nothing, one finds happiness. Depending on nothing, one attains the absolute. Depending on nothing, one passes through tranquility to the one self. When one realises he is neither the actor nor the one who watches, the mind storm is stilled. The actions of the sage, free of pretense and motive, shine like clear light. Not so those of the deluded seeker, who affects a peaceful demeanour while remaining firmly attached. Unbounded, unfettered, untethered from the projections of mind, the wise are free to play and enjoy, or retire to mountain caves. Whether honouring a spiritual scholar, a god or holy shrine, whether seeing a desirable woman, a king or beloved friend, the heart of the sage is unmoved. Though his servants, sons, wives and daughters, grandchildren and all his relatives ridicule and despise him, the sage is undismayed. Though pleased, he is not pleasured. Though pained, he does not suffer. This wonderful state is understood only by those like him. The belief in duty creates a relative world for his performance. The wise one knows himself to be formless timeless, all-pervasive, immaculate, and thus transcends duty and the world. Even doing nothing, the dull one is anxious and distracted. Even amidst great action, the wise one remains still. Even in practical life, the wise one remains happy, happy to sit, happy to sleep, happy to move about, happy to speak, happy to eat. Because he knows self, the wise one is not dis erupted by practical life. He is deep and still like a vast lake. He is not like ordinary people. His sorrows have vanished. For the deluded, even rest is an activity. For the wise, even action bears the fruit of stillness. The deluded are often adverse to the things of life. To one with no thought for body, attachment and aversion have no meaning. The deluded mind is caught up in thinking and not thinking. Though the mind of the wise one may think what thoughts come, he is not aware of it. The sage sees nothing being done, even when performed by his hands. Like a child he is pure and acts without reason. Blessed indeed is he who knows self. Though seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, eating, he never desires nor changes. For one who is void and changeless, where is the world and its imaginings? Where is the end of it? Where even the possibility? Glorious indeed is he who, free of desire, embodies bliss itself. He has become absorbed in self. In short, the great soul who has realised truth is free of desire, enjoyment and liberation. In all of space and time, he is attached to nothing. What remains for one who is awareness itself, who sees the non-existence of a phenomenal world created by the mere thought of a name? Peace is natural for one who knows for certain nothing exists, who sees appearances are like illusions, and to whom the inexpressible 
is apparent. Rules of conduct, detachment, renunciation and asceticism. What are these to one who sees the unreality of things? To one who is the light of awareness? How can there be joy or sorrow, bondage or liberation for one who perceives non-existence and lights the infinite? Until self-realisation, illusion prevails. But the sage lives without thoughts of I or mine. His tether to illusion is severed. What is knowledge? What is universe? What are thoughts like I am the body or the body is mine? The sage is imperishable, sorrowless. He is self alone. When a weak man gives up meditation, he falls prey to whims and desires. Even hearing truth, the man of dull intellect holds on to illusion. Through effort and suppression, he may appear outwardly composed, but inside he craves the world. Though others see him working, the sage does nothing. Awakening has banished effort. He finds no reason to do or say. The sage is fearless, unassailable. No darkness, no light, nothing to lose. Nothing. Patience, discrimination, even fearlessness. What are these things to the sage? His nature cannot be described. He is not a person. No heaven, no hell, no liberation for the living. In short, creation is void. What more can be said? The sage neither yearns for fulfilment nor frets over non-attainment. His mind is cool and brimming with sweetness. Detached from desire, the sage neither praises peace nor blames the wicked, equally content in happiness and misery. He would not change a thing. The sage neither rejects the world nor desires self. He is free of joy and sorrow. He does not live and cannot die. The wise one lives without hope. He has no attachment to his children, wife or anyone. Pleasure means nothing to him. His life is glorious. The sage wanders about as he pleases and lives on whatever may come. Contentment ever dwells in his heart. And when the sun sets, he rests where he is. Rooted in being, no thought of being born or reborn, the great soul is indifferent to the death or birth of his body. The wise one stands alone, caring for nothing, bereft of possessions, doubts rent asunder. He goes where he will, unhindered by opposites. He is truly blessed. The wise one has no sense of mine. To him, earth, stone and gold are the same. The knots of his heart have unravelled. 